Pepe Le Pew, the lovesick womanizing skunk, is without a doubt the most controversial Looney Tune. A character who can only be described as a product of his time, filmmakers have struggled to adapt him in the modern day, leading to him being supposedly cancelled. In 2023, Pepe turns 78, and in this video we'll trace his evolution from 1945 to now. To do so, we'll touch on his design and personality changes over a near eight decades of shorts, series and movies, while also discussing his notoriety and current place in pop culture in this edition of Cartoon Evolution. <laughs> One of the Warner Brothers Cartoon Studios' most valuable assets, animator Chuck Jones, was assigned his own animation unit in 1938. At the time, the studio was desperate to find new star characters, with only Daffy Duck and Porky Pig keeping the series alive. With Bugs Bunny and Elmer Fudd still a few years away, Jones began building a roster of his own. Jones spawned several interesting characters, including a cute Disney-esque mouse named Sniffles, who saw mild success with a series of 16 cartoons between 1939 and 1946. He, however, fizzled quickly, particularly with the studio moving towards a more frenzied, madcap style of tune in the early 40s. Jones's ensuing characters showed more and more promise, as he learned to adapt to the new style and began to form his own trademark character character style. In the middle 40s, Jones and writing partner Michael Maltese, proficient in hilarious dialogue and character work, developed an idea for a character named Stinky, a promiscuous, odorous French skunk who thinks he's, well, stink don't stink. His first cartoon, 1945's Odorable Kitty, sees a mistreated male cat hatch an elaborate plan to evade his abusers. He disguises himself as a skunk by dousing in black and white paint, onion, garlic and Limburger cheese. While he succeeds in warding off his perpetrators, he catches the attention of Stinky. Philandering, obnoxious and egotistical, Stinky pursues the disguised cat, showering him with unwanted sensual affection. The cat spends the cartoon trying to evade the skunk, who comes after him in hot pursuit. Nothing he does, even disguising himself as Bugs Bunny, manages to keep Stinky away. By the end, the cat is exhausted, succumbing to the skunk. However, before he can get his way, it's revealed that Stinky isn't all he seems either. He's not a wild French bachelor, but an American husband and father. Unless you count Jones's 1946 Merry Melody, Fair and Wormer, which briefly features a similar skunk seen in a hopping movement that would later become a signature of Pepe's, Jones and Maltese's Amorous Mephidite wouldn't appear in another cartoon for two years, perhaps because then studio head Edward Seltzer, described as Jones's bitterest foe at the studio, didn't think audiences would find the character funny, allegedly quipping during an early screening, nobody would laugh at that shit. Regardless, he did appear again in 1947's Sentimental Over You. This cartoon took on the same formula, except it's a bald dog who finds herself the object of Stinky's desires after dressing herself in a black and white coat. Again, the chase is on as the skunk even more aggressively pursues the frightened pooch, climaxing with a sequence where he relentlessly chases her around a table. By cartoon's end, the dog reveals her true self, to which the skunk, engaging in an especially troubling act of coercion, pretends he is also a dog in disguise, winning her love under false pretenses. Again, Jones and Maltese took a break from Stinky, with the character next appearing in Arthur Davis's 1946 cartoon Odor of the Day. Here, Davis instead depicted him as a screwball comic relief character, fighting an odorous dog over a bed on a cold winter night. The skunk's personality and formula are so vastly different here that many fans assert that it's a completely different character altogether. However, animation historian Jerry Beck has confirmed that the character is one and the same, noting that it's just Art Davis's own weird version of him. Despite Seltzer's misgivings, the previous Jones Maltese cartoon proved popular enough to warrant another the following year. Maltese, who apparently wasn't overly fond of the character either, later said, 
we did it again because that's what we did when something went over well. 1949's For Sentimental Reasons saw the skunk, now officially named Pepe Le Pew, back to his pestering ways as he, again, mistakes a cat who's accidentally been covered in paint for a skunk. Again, the cartoon sees Pepe chasing the cat around, forcing himself onto her and coercing her, unaware that his feelings aren't reciprocated. The name Pepe Le Pew came from the 1937 French film Pepe Le Moucou, about a romantic French thief played by Jean Gabon. Even more so, Le Pew was a takeoff of the version of Le Moucou portrayed by Charles Boyer in the popular 1938 American remake Algiers. Mel Blanc, the voice artist behind Le Pew, even based Pepe's voice on Boyer's Le Moucou. You're beautiful. That's easy to say. I know a lot of people have told you. But what I'm telling you is different, see? Ah, my little darling, it is love at first sight, is it not? No? Though some suggest he imbued a touch of French entertainer Maurice Chevalier into his performance. Hello everybody, here is your old friend Maurice Chevalier speaking to you from Paris. Regardless, Blank performed Pepe with an outrageous faux French accent, something many believe to be the only legitimately hilarious thing about the cartoons. On for Sentimental Reasons was a gigantic success, going on to win the Academy Award for Best Short Subject Cartoons. Seltzer, of course, gladly accepted the Oscar at the ceremony. The success led to an entire ongoing series of cartoons, even though some at the studio had a dislike for them. Maltese lamented, we had to keep making them. As such, For Sentimental Reasons turned out to be incredibly important. It not only established Pepe's name, final form and general formula, but it shifted the series setting to France, utilising the location and culture as an endless source for visual and verbal gags, particularly once background artist Maurice Noble, a regular Jones collaborator, boarded the series with 1953's Wild Over You. Sentimental Reasons also introduced the cat who would become the ongoing object of Pepe's desire. 45 years later, she'd officially be known as Penelope Pussycat, but throughout the ensuing Golden Age cartoons, her name would regularly alter from Penelope to Fifi to Fabret to Felice. Henceforth, Pepe headlined at least one cartoon every year until 1962, two years before the Warner Brothers cartoon studio closed due to dwindling theatre attendance and the emergence of TV. 1955, however, saw the release of two Pepes, while 1958 saw none. Each cartoon in true Looney style took on a pun title, many of which referring to Pepe's stench. Jones directed every Pepe cartoon except for 1955's Really Scent, directed by Abe Levito. Each Pepe cartoon essentially followed the same formula. The obsessive skunk falls head over heels for Penelope, whom for some reason or another he mistakes for a skunk. He chases her around Paris, showering her with unwanted affections. He forces upon her unsolicited physical contact, holds her and sometimes imprisons her against her will, uses every manipulative trick in his book against her and to lighten the mood, throws in the occasional not so romantic romantic one-liner and creepy pickup line. Making Pepe's forceful efforts even more confronting is the fact that Penelope is a non-verbal character, suffering through Pepe's advances mostly in silence. Though the only cartoon to depict the character as the charade of a married American family man was his first proto-appearance, some argue that this aspect of Pepe is canonical, that he is a character playing a character. However, others prefer to take Pepe at face value. Considering so many tunes debuted in prototypes with bizarre quirks and appearances that were ironed out later on. In his memoir, Chuck Amuck, Jones noted that inspiration for Pepe came from writer and gag man Ted Pierce, an alleged hopeless romantic whose attitude towards sex, he said, was direct and uncompromising. Jones further noted that Pierce's devotion to women was at times pathetic, at times psychological logical, but always enthusiastic. Just as Pepe Le Pew could not envision that any female would run away from him, so Ted could not really believe that any woman could honestly refuse his honestly stated need for her. Jones stated definitively, 
it would have been impossible to have worked with Tant and not come up with the idea of Pepe Le Pew. It is worth noting, however, that many of Jones's stories have been refuted as being not entirely truthful. In fact, Jones also admitted to being his own inspiration for Pepe, writing, All characters come from within yourself. Pepe is the individual I always wanted to be. So sure of his appeal to women that it never occurs to him that his attentions might be unwelcome or even offensive. Pepe Le Pew represents the way I always wanted to be with girls and never had the courage to be. I tried to make Pepe's confidence a part of my own personality, hoping to share in his sexual success. If you can't do it yourself, animate somebody who can. As such, it's clear that the comedy in the Pepe cartoons, if we can call it that, is meant to come at the expense of the character. A lovesick fool who is so certain of his own Don Juan-esque prowess that he simply doesn't notice that his, in his mind, romantic actions are unrequited. Nor that he stinks like a rotting sewer. We're not supposed to be cheering on Pepe, but laughing at him. Jones noted, Pepe's sexual confidence is absolute. He sees rejection as no more than a temporary setback and every pursuit as an interesting variation on the road to inevitable success. The skunk may at first sight seem to be an unlikely lover, but these films would never succeed if the hero were a human being with bad breath, underarm odours or smelly feet. It is only when an animal such as a skunk is unaware of his problem, which is built in and instantly obvious to everyone else, that the situation has comic potential. Regardless, the confronting nature of the Pepe cartoons have come under fire in recent years, a time when society is more aware and audiences no longer have an appetite for such humour, if they ever really did. Particularly in a post Me Too world, Pepe has found himself a fairly controversial figure, a symbol of a more oppressive and oblivious age. Comedian Dave Chappelle called out Pepe in a 2000 comedy special saying, Like I was with my nephew, we sitting there, we watching Pepe the Pew, and I say to my nephew, I say, now pay attention to this guy, because he's funny. I used to watch him when I was little. And we watched the Pepe the Pew, but I'm old now, I'm looking like, good God, what kind of f rapist is this guy? Like, take it easy, Pepe. <laughs> In 2017, cultural diversity, philosophy and sociology professor Ambery George wrote that Pepe was complicit in sexual harassment, stalking and abuse. And famously, New York Times columnist Charles M. Blow wrote in 2021 that the Pepe cartoons normalised rape culture, later commenting, it taught overcoming a woman's strenuous, even physical objections was normal, adorable, funny. They didn't even give the woman the ability to speak. Jones's daughter, Linda Jones Clow, intensely refutes these accusations, saying, If the Pepe cartoons were currently being made, I would say they should and would be considered inappropriate. But I have a great deal of difficulty believing that anyone, anywhere, was so influenced by watching Pepe Le Pew cartoons that they pursued a life of debauchery. At that, it is important to understand that Pepe's cartoons arose in a different time, one in which such behaviour even was tolerated or seen as normal. At the time, these kinds of gags regularly appeared and were accepted across all media. This may even turn out to be a surprise party. What's a surprise? Uh-uh. Not yet. When? Better have a drink first. Viewed through a modern lens, we can understand that Pepe's actions were never okay, nor was the intent to derive humour from such dark and troubling concepts. However, we do need to view these cartoons through the lens of their period. Viewed analysed and respected as art from a historical standpoint, despite their glaring ignorance. I debated about even tackling Pepe in this series and have been hesitant to do so for five years, but ignoring Pepe would be to disregard one of the Looney Tunes most historically important characters, through which crucial conversations can be had. And what use would my platform be as a historical source or I as a historian if I 
didn't at least help start these conversations. Pepe's intentions never seem malicious. He's simply painted as a hopeless romantic whose heart is bigger than his head. And taking Jones's comments about Pepe's oblivion and its comedic possibilities into consideration, it's clear that these cartoons were made with no ill intent either. Perhaps as a result of societal norms of the time, Jones and others creating or even watching the cartoons were just as oblivious to the nature of them as Pepe was to himself. Nevertheless, cartoon and comic writer and historian Mark Evanier questions whether Pepe was ever that funny, further suggesting that he was perhaps never entirely popular to begin with. He notes that, unlike practically every other core Looney Tune, Pepe never received his own spin-off comic, and his appearances in comics were beyond rare. He further conveys that years later, during the great Looney Tunes merchandise boom of the 80s and 90s, Pepe still didn't have any merchandising potential. Not counting the two proto appearances, Art Davis's quick fling with the character, or his cameo appearance in Frizz Freeling's 1954 Sylvester and Tweety cartoon Dog Pounded, Pepe only starred in a pretty modest 12 cartoons. That's a lot more than the likes of Marvin the Martian and Taz Devil, two characters who grew to have even larger followings, but it's also a far cry from the hundreds of Bugs, Daffy and Porky cartoons. Film and animation historian Leonard Moulton noted that the Pepe cartoons hinged on a one note relationship and provided a restrictive formula which never escaped from the sameness of storylines. Not only did the formula remain the same, but the gags did too, meaning that Pepe's cartoons were practically indistinguishable from one another. They showed the least experimentation or deviation from any of the core Looney Tunes series. No wonder he appeared in so few cartoons and was put into retirement, even following the DePatty Freeling takeover of the studio in 1964, which resulted in a series of terrible cartoons that were no more than a last ditch effort to flog a dead horse. In fact, following Pepe's run in the Golden Age cartoons, his subsequent appearances were relatively sparse. In the early 60s, his cartoons were often played in television package series The Bugs Bunny Show, in which he also featured in the opening sequence and made occasional appearances in newly animated bridging segments. One episode, in fact, even saw him as the host. Various Pepe cartoons were additionally bundled in a selection of 70s and 80s Looney Tunes television specials and compilation movies, while others additionally feature the character in newly animated linking segments. 1979's Bugs Bunny's Looney Christmas Tales saw Pepe appear as a caroler during the Bugs Bunny's Christmas Carol segment, while he appeared on the poster for 1981's Looney 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 Bugs Bunny movie, he only featured in a very brief cameo during the film. 1982's Bugs Bunny's Mad World of Television saw Bugs as a TV exec on the lookout for a star with sex appeal, attempting to poach Pepe to star in a series. And in 1983's Daffy Duck's movie Fantastic Island, he also appeared in a short linking segment. Pepe made a very small resurgence in the 1990s and 2000s, featuring prominently in 1995's Carrot Blanca, one of a handful of Looney Tunes theatrical revival shorts from the decade. A spoof of Warner's classic 1942 film Casablanca, the short saw Pepe in the role of Major Strasser and Penelope as leading lady Ilsa. Of course, in true Pepe style, the cartoon wouldn't be complete without a couple of interactions, notably somewhat more toned down than usual. 1996's Space Jam also saw him as a member of the Toon Squad basketball team alongside Michael Jordan and the other Toons. Though he wasn't a leading character, he was used in a number of hilarious and memorable gags. Here he appeared for the first time in a live action environment, utilising cell shading to give him a three dimensional look. Another more obscure hybrid appearance was in 1998's educational video Bugs Bunny's Silly Seals, which saw new animation of him and Penelope mixed with classic tunes. Additionally, 2003's Looney Tunes Back in Action saw him make a brief cameo when the crew travel to Paris. Here he's seen stinking out Brendan Fraser's DJ when asked for directions to the Eiffel Tower. The 1990s and 2000s however did see more Pepe appearances on TV, though still mostly small and sporadic. He appeared in a handful of Tiny Toon Adventures episodes between 1990 and 1992 as one of the teachers at 
Acme Luniversity, acting as the mentor of Fifi Le Fieu, a young, purple and white skunk, who much like Pepe, has a French accent and a very playful personality. He also appeared in a 1994 episode of Animaniacs and a 1999 episode of Hysteria, both in non-speaking cameos. More predominantly, he appeared in the 1997 Sylvester and Tweety Mysteries episode Is Paris Stinking, in which Sylvester, Tweety and Granny are tasked with finding the cause of a foul stench that has appeared in Paris. Of course, the stink turns out to be Pepe, who at the end of the episode confuses Sylvester for a skunk. Similarly, he also appeared in the 2000 spin-off movie Tweety's High Flying Adventure, where he cameos as a customs officer who confuses both Penelope and Sylvester for skunks. Pepe also made a few appearances in Baby Looney Tunes between 2001 and 2005 as Baby Pepe. Though he led a couple of episodes, he also starred in the musical segment Viva La Pew, where Baby Penelope also quickly cameos. In a 2006 episode of the futuristic Lunatics Unleashed, another alt Pepe appeared, Pierre Le Pew, a humanised villainous descendant of Pepe. Pierre is the head of an illegal wrestling ring which hosts fights between tunes. He has skunk-like black and white hair and a French accent, and is seen using stinky cologne. Also in 2006's direct-to-video movie Bar Humduck A Looney Tunes Christmas, Pepe briefly appeared as one of the workers at Daffy Duck's Lucky Duck Superstore. He's seen here harassing Penelope Pussycat, a store customer. Hey Casanova, that's not what I meant when I said woo the customers. She does however become charmed by him under the mistletoe at the movie's climax. Additionally, throughout the early 2000s, Pepe could be seen in a few Looney Tunes webtoons, mostly in non-speaking background cameos. His most prominent role, however, saw him as the owner of a computer dating service that Porky signs up to, also showing up to Porky's date and making a mess of it. The period additionally saw Pepe, like many other tunes, making the occasional appearance in incredibly popular television commercials. It's also worth noting that actor Johnny Depp, a huge fan of the skunk, supposedly used Pepe as an inspiration for his iconic performance as the womanising Captain Jack Sparrow in Disney's Pirates of the Caribbean films, some of the biggest of the 2000s and 2010s. Perhaps Pepe's biggest impact on pop culture throughout the era. It's clear that, across this time, filmmakers struggled to find a place for Pepe, whether that be because he had no merchandise appeal, or because he was too problematic for more contemporary audiences. And as time has gone on, it's become even more obvious just how hard it's been to reassimilate Pepe into modern Looney Tunes. In the Looney Tunes show, running between 2011 and 2014, Pepe was used sparingly over a very small selection of episodes, mostly cameoing during Merry Melody's song segments. In the second episode of season one, however, he's prominently seen hitting on Lola Bunny as she plans to marry Bugs. She oddly falls for Pepe and decides to marry him instead, though they later break up. This series gave the characters fresh, angular redesigns in the style of classic Jones characters. Pepe's design, however, stayed fairly consistent with his classic cartoons. He also made a brief cameo in director video spin-off movie Looney Tunes Rabbits Run as a perfume mogul selling Lola's newest scent. He also appeared in a few episodes of New Looney Tunes between 2018 and 2020, where filmmakers attempted to revamp him as a James Bond-esque playboy spy. He appeared in a fairly outlandish design with a small angular body and a large head. He was usually seen wearing a red tuxedo and sporting an exaggerated hair quiff. This iteration was a decent attempt at adapting Pepe for the modern audience, removing all references to sexual assault and drawing parallels with a more contemporary Lothario. Following this appearance, however, Pepe has hardly been seen, leading many fans to suggest that the character had been cancelled. Notably, he didn't appear once during the Looney Tunes cartoons revival series and was sidelined from the cast of Bugs Bunny Builders. Deadline reported in 2021 that Warners considered the character 
character a thing of the past and had no plans to use him in any other current projects, including the upcoming Tiny Toons Luniversity. Despite his protege, Fifi Le Fume, set to be a core cast member. He did however feature in one insanely small cameo in a 2021 episode of the Animaniacs revival series. While Pepe was supposed to make a cameo appearance in 2021's Space Jam sequel, A New Legacy, the grand return of the tunes to the big screen, his scene was ultimately removed from the final film. Deadline reported in 2021 that the live action portion of Pepe's scene had in fact been shot and starred Jane the Virgin actress Grace Santo, though Pepe's portion was not even roughly animated. Deadline noted, Pepe was set to appear in a black and white Casablanca-like Rick's Cafe sequence. Pepe, playing a bartender, starts hitting on a woman at the bar played by Santo. He begins kissing her arm, which she pulls back, then slamming Pepe into the chair next to her. She then pours her drink on Pepe and slaps him hard, sending him spinning in a stool, which is then stopped by LeBron James's hand. James and Bugs Bunny are looking for Lola, and Pepe knows her whereabouts. Pepe then tells the guys that Penelope Cat has filed a restraining order against him. James makes a remark in the script that Pepe can't grab other tunes without their consent. Santo, a victim of sexual assault and owner of a non-profit aimed at empowering domestic violence victims, was said to be upset with the scene's removal, with a spokesperson saying her involvement was such a big deal for her, as it would have given her a chance to let younger girls and younger boys know that Pepe's behaviour is unacceptable. They added, if anyone was going to slap a sexual harasser like him, Grace wished it would be her. Pepe is undoubtedly a controversial and complex character who artists have struggled to make work in modern times. This however, quite possibly could have been the perfect way to re-assimilate him back into the tunes. It would have addressed his past behaviour by making him face the ramifications, and in turn would have made a statement on the nature of his cartoons. Perhaps Warners felt it was simply easier to just remove him and not address it altogether. Unfortunately, this means that Penelope, who was heavily featured in early promotion and merchandise, was also removed from the movie, continuing to keep her silenced. Will we see Pepe again anytime soon? Probably not, and perhaps that's for the best. Pepe can't continue in his classic iteration ever again, that's for sure. But until Warners finds a way to make him work, if they even want to, we may just have to be content with leaving Pepe a thing of the past. And perhaps that's just how it should be. And at that, I want to know your thoughts on Pepe Le Pew. How do you think he can work in modern times and what's your favourite of his cartoons? As always, join the conversation down below.